HVAC 360 is brought to you today by Construction Dummies. Need more workers on your project, but you know that they'll only end up slowing you down and creating mistakes that you'll have to fix anyway? Well, what you need is a few construction dummies on your team. These full-size, lifelike workers will fool any site superintendent at a distance. They'll also sway slightly and move like molasses, because that's what they're filled with. And every Friday will be a treat when you not only get your paycheck, but you'll get theirs as well. Cha-ching! A true win-win. Pick up your construction dummies today. Also available from Deadweight Industries, engineering dummies. And as always, the original carpool dummies. <laughs> What's up? Welcome back. Matt Nelson here, your host for HVAC 360, helping you be the best of the brightest in the field of HVAC. Uh, simply put, we do that by sharing lessons learned in the field and talking with industry experts. Uh, but we don't really stop there. I want to encourage you to double down in your weekly dose, as usual, um, of HVAC knowledge by hopping on over to HVAC360.com and join my growing community of people just like you. Um, just want to let you know that uh, I just rolled out something on Black Friday. I'll give you a little sneak peek this week. It was a membership site. Uh, so I'm not going to open it up to the public just yet, um, but only it's only available to my mailing list right now. And I'm only l opening it up to a few people. So space is limited. Go for the newsletter today and get that special introductory offer. Uh, so what's up for this week? Uh, this week I wanted to share a couple of highlights from a recent ASHRAE meeting that I went to with distinguished lecturer Dr. Kankari. Uh, Dr. Kankari is a uh, one of the distinguished lecturers in the distinguished lecture program uh, that ASHRAE does, and I you know I get a, get some questions every now and then uh, asking me what you know what ASHRAE does. ASHRAE does have a, a great system. Um, it's completely transparent. If you go to the ASHRAE website uh, and ashrae.org and type in distinguished lecturers, uh, you can actually find a PDF of everybody who's on the list. Um, these are people who've been uh, thoroughly vetted and do a really great job of talking on their topics and they they list those topics as well on the website so if you are looking for somebody to uh, speak to your organization uh, this is definitely a resource for you um, and as usual ASHRAE does a really great job I, I really can't believe that more organizations don't do something similar to this but I, I just don't see it being done um, also, I, I guess just as a highlight, Dr. Kankari has a number of ASHRAE journals, uh, ASHRAE journal articles that he's published uh, on this topic, and it kind of uh, supplements what I'm talking about. If you want to learn more, um, these are available free for ASHRAE members. Uh, if you're not an ASHRAE member, then you're going to have to pay for it, um, as the ASHRAE journal is one of those member benefits. All right, but before uh, diving into this topic uh, about healthcare and airflow, um, one of the things that he, he, he kind of covered um, and he really stressed in the beginning of his talk was that, you know, we're all in this comfort business. And, you know, I think it's, it's all too often that we forget that this is exactly at the core of what we do uh, as engineers. Um, you know, we get really uh, uptight and, 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 and narrowly focused uh, when we're tasked with, uh, you know, uh, dealing with animals and dealing with labs. If you look in the ASHRAE, ASHRAE handbooks, um, another member benefit, um, one of the ASHRAE handbooks, they talk about, you know, how these narrow temperature ranges are required for these animals and these laboratory environments. Um, but, you know, just as important is the human occupants. And we kind of don't take that same level of rigor and I'll stress that in much importance uh, with our human occupants, those people that we're trying to make comfortable again. And we, we talked a little bit about this with Robert Bean and, and, and how ASHRAE, um, you know, these comfort standards are really, really important. And, you know, when you talk about the built environment, how much of a disconnect uh, there can be um, and how important it is to get 
uh, the building occupants uh, to be very productive. I mean, that's why you have a special, you know, outside of your home, you have these businesses, these commercial office buildings, your health you know, healthcare, you have these places where you want thermal comfort. Um, you want everybody to be working at their, at their, at their peak because really the cost of having that building, owning that building, operating that building is really 90% in the building is, is in the workers, the, the staff, what you pay to have people there performing their job. And a lot of times we don't, don't stress an, that enough. Now, obviously, ASHRAE, ASHRAE has a standard, ASHRAE 55. Um, and one of the things that, that he talked about uh, when he was, ta- uh, when he was uh, presenting to us is he, he took a, you know, just, a stro- just, a, just a hand raised survey um, of who in the room, and these are room filled with you know, engineers and, and uh, owner and uh, manufacturers reps, um, who in the room actually knows about ASHRAE 55, which is, which again is the comfort standard. Um, now, you know more than the people in the, uh, the room because about only 10% of the people raise their hand. And this is kind of disconcerting. Again, we're in the business of comfort and only 10 people know about the standard. Now, going a step further, he asked how many people actually apply this standard in their daily practice. And most of those hands that were up went down. Um, it was actually kind of, under, uh, it was about 1% of the people, um, you know, so in a room of, you know, you know, 70 people, there might have been one or two people that had their hands raised that used this uh, in their design practice. And it really is something that uh, we don't spend enough time knowing about. You know, I mean, compare this to ASHRAE Standard 90.1, uh, the energy standard out there. I mean, everybody probably knows about a- ASHRAE Standard 90.1 or uses it and applies it on every single project that they do. But not, you know, the same can't be said for ASHRAE. 55. You know, and I, I guess part of the problem is that thermal comfort, he stated, thermal comfort is like happiness. Um, you know, it's a state of mind and, and nothing can measure that. Um, and that's really true. I mean, you can you can survey for thermal comfort, but you can't really measure thermal comfort. It, it, it's, so, it's so subjective um, from a occupant standpoint. I mean, somebody who is, you know, likes it really cold is not going to be happy with somebody who likes it really hot. It's just not going to happen. They just have different expectations of the environment. So um, that you're never going to reconcile with a meter. Um, obviously, you can survey it, but you can't reconcile it with a meter. So, so diving off of that and going into the, the healthcare portion of, of what he really talked about. And, um, you know, we, we talked about, um, we narrowed the focus, generally speaking, of, you know, all the different environments in a healthcare uh, in a healthcare setting, and we focused on the the patient rooms and operating rooms. And I think the nice thing and the interesting thing to see visually, at least, um, and you know, there's some visuals in the articles. But the the nice visual thing to see is that he used computational fluid dynamics software, now or CFD. Now, this computational fluid dynamics software, you know, this is something that's that's really fancy. That's really kind of you know, it's it's really high tech, um, and I think that you you can't really use it on a project by project basis. I think it's 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 a little unless you're doing something that's really you know that really requires it. It's hard to use these computational fluid dynamics models uh, to be able to you know set something up and and figure out exactly what you need. Um, if there's you know certain things that. Uh, you need answers to maybe that's the case, um, and I think that it it might be a good situation where you take uh, typical things like uh, operating rooms and patient rooms and you model those to kind of find an optimal and a best uh, configuration and and really that's kind of what he uh, provided. I mean this this is really what he does his specialty. Um, if you need computational fluid dynamics, to, you know, to look them up um, and. Uh, you know, see how he can help you. Um, but, you know, I think it's still limited. There's still only a certain number of, number of variables. I've seen this done uh, not only with this, but other, other different uh, um, situations. And it really is a number crunching exercise. And, and it's not something that's going to be, um, you know, again, rel- readily available for all projects. And it's not something that 
solves all your problems. It just kind of gives you the tendencies. You set up the, you set up your expectations, you set up your assumptions, and then you can kind of see exactly what's, what's happening. So the one thing that, that he focused on was thermal mixing and contamination mixing for these environments. Um, you know, I, I think that you want to have the contamination. You really want to have containment in a healthcare environment. Um, this is not something that's kind of like, you know, and, and with, with any sort of situation, you know, the air conditioning, this process isn't a one through operation. You don't just cool a space and then the, that, that air just leaves the space. It's, it's a combination. Of, there's a portion that just gets returned, but there's a portion that just keeps mixing with the space. So you can see where this thermal mixing and contamination mixing really becomes critical when you're dealing with healthcare environments, when you're trying to make sure that you have the, the healthiest environment possible for your patient. Now, let's start with the patient room. The patient room, obviously the contamination that he was focusing on was from the patient. Um, you know, not like there wouldn't be other contaminant, contaminants around. Um, it, it's, it's different than the operating room, but he focused on the patient being the source of all the contaminants in this. Now they had the, the layout of the, the room, the typical layout. They had a couple linear diffusers just washing the wall, the outside exterior wall. Uh, they had one over the uh, patient area, and then they had the return uh, located right above the door. So, you know, I mean, if, you know, from a standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, until you start going through um, and working this computational fluid dynamics model and you see that everything you know uh, you know from the from the from mixing standpoint that mixes well but then you look in the contamination uh, standpoint and that also mixes well so that just spreads whatever the patient you know is bringing into that environment that just spreads it all over the room and doesn't really work to contain the um, uh, those contaminants so what could you do better? And, and that's what his, his point was, is that he can use these models and improve the design, the layout of what we're doing here. So what he had done, uh, what he had done, what he did was he took the return and he placed it over uh, just behind um, the uh, supply over the patient. Now, what you noticed when you, you did that is that the supply, the linear supply over the patient when it was had a directional airflow, it wasn't a two-way flow, it was just a one-way throw on this diffuser, and it was throwing basically, like, it was at the head of the patient, it was th throwing air down, um, you know, towards the foot of the bed. But what that one-way throw created uh, was this area of low pressure behind the diffuser, and that's, where he, that's why he wanted to locate the return there. So what happened was, since it was over the head of the patient, all the contaminants would be drawn up, you know, naturally through buoyancy, but through this low pressure, it would all be funneled out, out the return and back into the, uh, the duct system, where it can be dealt with and, 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 and filtered. Uh, and I think that was that was really creative. I mean, it's it's something that you don't necessarily know and might be counterintuitive. And you might think, hey, you know what? If you put the the supply and the return right next to each other, you're going to have some uh, short cycling. But you can really use the, the the physics of the air to create that low pressure and use that to your advantage in returning the air. Now, the patient room. Uh, the operating room, rather. Uh, the operating room is, 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 is a little bit different. Um, if you're never dealing with an operating room, the one thing you'll know is you'll, you're going to have this, in the center of the room, you're going to have these perforated grills. Uh, that's to create a laminar flow that, that the idea is to wash the patient with this, this constant wash of air to keep the patient, because of the open body cavities, to keep the patient... Uh, to, to keep them germ free that you don't want the contaminant you don't want the contaminants landing on the patient that's just a recipe for disaster and that's the last thing you want to do so they have these uh, the ring of linear diffusers over the patient that just washes the patient uh, and then the idea is that they would you know hit the floor and they would go down to uh, low return grills on opposite corners of the operating room and that's how it would work um, but when you use the computational fluid dynamic model, um, you all of a sudden you see all the the churn uh, that happens in the room, 
uh, not only with the the airflow and the mixing uh, and the temperatures, um, you know, because I guess you know if you're ever dealing with the operating rooms, the uh, the surgeons can never have it cold enough. They always want it ice cold. They, you know, it's 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 just one of those constants. If they could have it like a meat locker, they would be in heaven. It would just that's that's the way they want it. Um, so not only do they want the coldest air, and they you know this mixing actually ends up heating up the the rest of the environment, and you, you didn't really want that um, for you know the, the surgeon don't really want that. So. The one thing that he did was that, uh, in this case, I guess, um, the contaminants, the contaminants come from the medical staff. Um, they're the, you, know, you have this clean operating room, you have this patient that you're trying to protect, um, and you have all these people that are standing around, um, and that's the, that's the typical scenario. So the contaminants are actually coming from the staff. And what you're having is you have this, this washing effect, because the model will show that the, the, all the air will hit the floor, it'll roll out to the, the, the walls, and it'll curl back up onto the ceiling, and you'll have this kind of this circular cycle effect. Um, you still have the laminar flow kind of protecting the patient, but depending on the air change rate, you can have that um, start to be impinged upon, and you can actually start to wash the, um, wash the, the surgeons and the staff around the patient um, with more contaminants. You can just get this entrained, um, and it just, it just, it's not very helpful. So again, he's looking at what was, how can we make this better? Um, one of the things that I thought that was very creative that he did is he actually added a, um, a sort of like an air curtain. Now, if anybody knows anything about uh, smoke protection in atriums, they might find these uh, these baffles around openings uh, that hang down maybe like, you know, 12, 14 inches uh, to really try to contain smoke uh, in a sort of a, a, an atrium situation. Um, this is similar to that, but I guess you can envision just kind of these clear plastic baffles that are outside the laminar air uh, diffusers outside that zone, and what that did is is that kind of did uh, two functions. One, it prevented the mixing that was close to the patient. You know, when you get that uh, that circulating effect, um, that prevented that. It moved it out, so the airflow was more protected. So the laminar flow, you know, washed everybody. So that not only uh, prevented the contamination from mixing um, and getting closer to the staff, but it also allowed the staff to, you know, naturally get that colder air coming straight out of the diffuser. It wasn't being mixed. Uh, so they got what they wanted. So it was like this eight inch plastic baffle that he had put, you know, ring, you know, he had uh, put around the, uh, the laminar flow. So it was this, this, you know, I, I guess you call it a square, square rectangle. Um, but it was just this, this curtain, this baffle, the six inch baffle that hung off the ceiling. So that was one thing that he did. But he also started messing around with the return grills like he did in the, in the patient room. And he noticed that when he started bringing them up higher, if he actually put them on the ceiling, um, that when you get that circulation effect, it would sort of like, you, you, again, you'd have the laminar flow going straight over the patient, hitting the floor, rolling up the walls, and then it would just disappear into the diffuser. You, you, you would manage to contain a lot of the contaminants by just having the return grills on the ceiling. Now, this is kind of counterintuitive, and there was a little bit of a hubbub uh, about the fact that uh, he was relocating uh, based on, you know, this, this, this has been standard OR practice of, you know, opposite corners, low on the, you know, low on the floor to try to, you know, get all the contaminants out of there. Um, but, you know, you really see it from a fluid dynamic model. Um, obviously, he's trying to use his information to kind of, um, you know, towards the, uh, the, the different standards that uh, regulate healthcare design. Uh, and he's trying to kind of educate people a little bit more. Uh, but he said, you know what, I mean, there's, there was, uh, the, the one stipulation was you had to have it on opposite walls, and that's where the return was. But you could have them up high if you wanted to. That was, that was within the realm of... Um, you know, the, the realm of the engineer. Uh, not only that, but you could put them up high and you can have multiple ringing the room and that would accomplish the same effect as the, as the air returned back, you know, curled back up the 
exter- you know, the outside walls, it would just go back into the return and uh, back into the system. And that way you could eliminate a lot of the contaminants that were happening in the operating room. And that was, that was something that was really key. So you, you, with those two features, he really knocked out uh, a lot of um, a lot of problems that, that at least he was seeing from the, uh, the fluid dynamic model. So I guess a couple of takeaways that we have from this. In general, we do a really terrible job as people understanding the physics and the containment uh, movement in the whole process. I mean, we try to do, you know, we, we kind of rely on people who say, hey, lay it out like this and everything will work. Um, and we're like, okay, great. You know, we'd like to be told what to do. Um, if you want to say, and, it, and the, the explanation, it makes sense. It makes sense until you use, um, you know, this computational fluid dynamics and you actually watch the model work and you go, oh, yeah, I can, I can see that happening too. And, and you, really, you really don't know definitively um, as a person, you know, which, which, you know what's right. Um, we kind of have a, a certain idea of the way things work, but they're kind of limited. Uh, you don't know. You know if, if air is coming out of a diffuser, you know that it's going to go here, and then, you know, it may drop at a certain velocity. Um, but you don't know exactly. You just kind of, from there, you don't know. Um, and there's a lot of mixing that goes on in these in these rooms. Um, and sometimes mixing is good, and sometimes mixing is bad. And I think that you can't just, you know, across the board say, all right, we want thorough mixing all over the place. Um, you got to understand that there's some certain... Uh, areas that you don't, and I think this this is an example where the contaminants, the contamination, um, really is is one of those things that we don't think about. We just think about you know the air and the temperature, and we don't think about the other things that come along with that airflow. So uh, that is uh, something that you you really need to think about. Also, um, it's important never to forget that these standards are a minimum. Um, these standards, you can go above and beyond. You're not stuck to a minim- minimum. Um, you know, I, I, always, I always love the uh, uh, Chris Mathis quote, you know, the, the energy code, the 90.1. It's, it's you got to build it to this code. You know, if you, you got to follow this code. Um, you couldn't build it any crappier, I guess. If you followed that code, you couldn't build it any crappier. Um, so, but there's a lot of ways that you can make it better. And I guess that's kind of the important thing. Think outside, think outside the box. Um, computational fluid dy- dynamics is is a is a tool out there um, that is still being you know uh, kind of integrated into what we do. It's it's not uh, the be all end all, but it, it still is another tool that we can use when we want to find important information and we want to get real finite answers. It'll help us understand the physics of what we do. All right. Having said that, thanks so much for listening. I hope this was helpful. If you're looking for somebody who uh, wants to know more information, if they're in the healthcare industry, if, if uh, you know this, you would think this was helpful to them, um, consider passing this episode along. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, again, like I said in the in the beginning, uh, consider joining the growing community over at hvac360.com for some more weekly goodness. And lastly, you know, I'd really be honored, and if you'd consider leaving me a rating on Apple Podcasts, I'll give you a shout out as I usually do. I appreciate those ever so much, and it helps get this podcast recognized by more and more engineers. So that's a wrap for this episode of HVAC 360. I'm Matt Nelson, helping you be the best and the brightest in the field of HVAC. And as always, know what you build and share what you know.